are so thrilled that you all are here for our No to NATO, Yes to Peace. No to NATO, Yes to Peace. No to NATO, Yes to Peace. We are thrilled that this is a continuation of many, many, many years that the No to NATO organization has been having a, a pre-symposium before the NATO heads of state meet. And So uh, this year is the 75th anniversary of NATO. The NATO charter was signed here in Washington, D.C. 75 years ago, actually in April. Uh, so the heads of state of 32 NATO countries are coming to Washington, D.C. to tell us about uh, the warmongering that they're going to be doing in the next years. And we are here to say no to your... We have people from all over the world. And let's see, everybody that's from Norway, raise your hand. Yay. Everyone from Germany, raise your hand. Yay. Everyone from Belgium, raise your hand. Everyone from the UK, raise your hand. Uh, there's, there's, there's one guy, and he's been working since 6.30 with us this morning, so there's at least one from the UK that's here. Uh, how about from the Philippines? Do we have anyone from the Philippines? How about South, yay. How about South Korea, or uh, South Korean Americans that are here? Yay. How about other, oh my God. How about from France? Yay, we have three people here from France other countries that are here. How about from the, oh, there's one back there. Where are you from? Iran, yay. And how about from Canada? We do, Tamara's here somewhere. How about from uh, the warmongering United States of America? Okay, well, we've been working hard to put together this uh, symposium for you. We have 15, uh, uh, coordinating uh, organizations, and the leader of these uh, organizations and coalition is David Swanson of World Beyond War. So David, please. Well, thank you so much to everyone who has made this happen, and I'm very much looking forward to an incredible lineup of speakers. Um, there are going to be numerous panels, we're going to have lunch breaks and coffee breaks. Uh, we are very, very privileged to be starting the day with a keynote speaker who, if you listen to your television, uh, including the report they did this morning on our event last night, ought to be thanking NATO for the lives of everyone in her country, uh, ought to be bowing down to NATO uh, in deep gratitude. Uh, and instead uh, has some actual wisdom and uh, possible alternatives to NATO that you will never ever hear on US television or in a US newspaper. Um, we are very, very honored and grateful to have here with us from Germany, a member of the German parliament, Sevim Dadelen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne, and thanks, David. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for organizing um, this event. Dear friends, just in time for its 75th anniversary, NATO has dropped its mask. And the NATO summit in Washington is one particularly illuminating moment in this revelation. The history of enlightenment <coughs> teaches us never to accept a person's or an organization's self-image at face value. So do the early sources of enlightenment ideas in ancient Greece. The Greeks 
already possess that insight. Inscribed above the temple of Apollo was the maxim, know thyself. If we make that injunction not lightly as a gentle reminder of the limits of human thought, but also as meaning what the pre-Socratic Greek philosopher Heracles insisted, that it belongs to all men to know themselves and think well, then we must regard self-knowledge as an essential human quality, which perhaps also ought to apply to our organizations. With NATO, however, it seems to be exactly the reverse. For NATO, denial of its true nature is part of the essence of the organization. Or put it another way, an almost meditative immersion in its own self-image as part of the essence of the military alliance. It is all the more astonishing then that Western media are so often content to reflect a thousand itera itera iterations of this self-image back to the public without question and without pausing to consider whether the image adequately represents reality. In fact, 75 years of NATO is equivalent to 70 years, 75 years of denial, though with a dramatic expansion of scale and scope in recent years. This is so in part because the three great myths of NATO are now fading. First, it is the central myth of a NATO organized as a defense community committed to international law. A NATO that is a community of constitutional states upholding the law, allowing international law to rule its action so that it exists for no other purpose but to defend the territory of its members. Yet, if we interrogate nature's actual policies, what do we find? In 1999, NATO itself conducted a war of aggression in breach of international law against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. NATO's war crimes included the bombing of a television station in Belgrade and an allegedly accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy, which killed three Chinese journalists. In 2011, NATO attacked Libya. It misused a UN Security Council resolution to fight a war for regime change, one result of which was that part of the country came under the rule of jihadist and Islamist group. Libya, on the whole, was plunged into a state of appalling misery and even suffered the return of slavery. In Afghanistan, NATO involved itself from 2003 in a war far from alliance territory, only to hand power 20 years later to the Taliban. Those overthrow had been the invasion's stated objective. That 20-year war in Afghanistan was marked by multiple war crimes, such as the October 2015 US airstrike on a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Kunduz, which needless to say, went unpunished. NATO has assumed the musketeers' motto, all for one and one for all. This means, in practice, that the deeds of individual NATO members must also be ascribed to the organization itself. Brown University puts the death toll of the US wars in the Middle East over the last 20 years alone at 4.5 million people. Wars like that in Iraq, based on lies, and which were nothing but egregious violations of international law. NATO's self-defense, self-image as a community of defense in adherence 
to international law simply does not match reality. We must rather draw the opposite conclusion. NATO is a community of illegality and of the violators of international law who, either separately or as an organization, conduct wars of aggression on a political, politically opportunistic basis. A second myth, perhaps the one most insistently impressed upon the public, is that of NATO as a community of democracies grounded in the rule of law. But if we examine the past with any care, this flattering self-presentation is immediately deflated by an ugly and shameful past. Until 1974, NATO member Portugal was ruled by a fascist dictatorship which waged blood-soaked colonial wars in Angola and in Mozambique. Those who resisted were driven into concentration camps like in Tarafal in Cap Verde, where many Angolans and Guinea-Bissauans were tortured to death. Like fascist Portugal, Greece and Turkey, both were members of NATO in the aftermath of their respective military coups. NATO itself, as we now know, put into motion Operation Gladio, a clandestine organization to be activated whenever democratic majorities threatened to vote against NATO membership. In Italy, for example, terrorist attacks were carried out in the name of far-left groups so as to discredit the Italian Communist Party in its effort to form a government. One might object that the, here we are referencing a bygone era and that NATO now stands ready to be called up in the global fight by Democrats against autocrats. But in this point too, any serious observer must conclude that something is amiss in that aspect of the 21st century alliance's self-image. Take Turkey under President Erdogan. It has repeatedly conducted illegal wars against Iraq and Syria, supported Islamist jihadist terrorist groups in Syria, and according to the German government's own assessment in 2016, is a lunch pad for Islamists, yet Turkey has always been and remains to this day a valued NATO member. Bilateral security agreements, such as those struck with Franco Spain, are now in place with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, even in the full knowledge that these states are avowedly anti-democratic. Clearly, the only meaningful criterion for dealing with the alliance is geopolitical advantage. NATO is neither a collective of democracies, nor does it exist to defend democracy. Third, NATO presently claims to be safeguarding human rights. And even if we were to overlook how NATO's actions trample on the rights to work, health and adequate housing a million times over, amidst growing poverty and a historic upward redistribution of wealth, wealth domestically, such a self-serving image does not withstand scrutiny in international matters. As we debate here, Today, prisoners taken in the U.S. so-called global war on terror still languish in Guantanamo Bay, where they have been kept without trial for nearly a quarter of a century. That is the reality of human rights in NATO's leading state. When it comes to freedom of opinion and the press, 
the U.S. supported by its NATO allies attempted to make an example of Julian Assange by tormenting him for 14 years. His sole crime was having revealed U.S. war crimes to the public. A smear campaign was then launched against him. Hillary Clinton and, and Mike Pompeo openly contemplated his murder. This is a bit of the reality of NATO's relationship to human rights. And I'm thrilled to be able to say, finally, that my friend Julian Assange is now a free man. <laughs> and also important, Julian is undefeated, dear friends. The international campaign for Assange, all of the confidential diplomatic talks and the like, were in the end successful. But we must also realize that the fight for Julian's freedom was also a part of the struggle for freedom itself. And this struggle continues to reach here at the very heart of the NATO system. Given the density of the propaganda, how tireless it operates in celebration of the NATO mythology, day in and day out, it is almost a miracle that not only is support for NATO crumbling worldwide, but that it is precisely those most exposed to its propaganda who are increasingly skeptical of the military pact. In the United States, public approval of NATO has been falling continuously over recent years, while majorities in Germany question the principle of defending all members. That is, they are no longer prepared to commit themselves to Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. Why is that? Why are people starting to have doubts about NATO, despite the onslaught of propaganda? The answer is simple enough. NATO is itself causing this crisis, and people sense that. While its defenders speak of the alliance as if it were eternal, the organization's drive toward escalation in Ukraine and its expansion into Asia is exceeding the alliance's own capacities. Just as with most empires, NATO is falling into a self-made trap of overextension. And in this regard, NATO is a political fossil unprepared to learn from the defeat of the German Empire in the First World War and appears to be repeating the gross miscalculations of the Kaiser's Germany only on a global scale. The German Empire believed it could wage a war on two fronts. Today, a similar conviction is gaining traction within NATO that it must not only confront Russia and China, but that it, also to, it is also to in, involve itself in the Middle East. This is a claim to global hegemony now under formulation. What hubris. NATO evidently sees itself waging a war on three fronts. But if it were to do this, its defeat would be certain right from the start. Given this, it is only logical that three particular meetings are planned for this week's NATO summit. The first is a working session devoted to further ramping up the alliance's own rearmament. The NATO Ukraine Council is next on the agenda. It is to discuss how the lavish financial transfers and pledges from NATO to Ukraine can be augmented with an increase in arms deliveries and eventual NATO membership for Ukraine. 
Third, there will be a session with the Asian Pacific Forum, or Asia Pacific Partners, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, and a meeting with the leaders of the European Union. 75 years after it was founded, NATO is to push for stepped-up belligerence in Ukraine ex and expansion into Asia, uh, Asia. The intention is to advance the NATOization of Asia and to put the strategy it believes it has already deployed successfully against Russia in place there. For the moment, the primary focus in the Pacific is not on direct NATO accession for Asian countries, but rather on the expansion of NATO's sphere of influence via bilateral agreements. And not only with the Asian Pacific Four, but also with the Philippines, Taiwan, and Singapore. Just as Ukraine was erected as a frontline state against Russia, NATO is hoping to transform Asian countries like the Philippines into challenger states vis-a-vis -vis China. The initial aim is to engage in a cold proxy war, but at the same time, to prepare for a hot US and NATO proxy war in Asia. And just as NATO enlargement was pursued under the boiling frog principle with regard to Russia, so with enlargement proceeding incrementally so as not to arouse Russia's suspicion too much, the policy of containing China now is compromised of lining up states one by one into a phalanx ready for war. The goal is, as ever, to avoid having to fight such a war oneself, but to be able to access allies' resources so as to conduct these cold and then hot wars. These developments are flanked by economic warfare, which is now also being directed against China and the main burden of which is borne by the economies of US client states. The US and NATO are in fact pursuing a method of war laid out by the ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu, who counseled that warfare not employing one's own resources was that type a state should aspire to wage. The problem for NATO strategists here is not only their willingness to set fire to the entire world, but also the self-imposed risk posed by their global pretensions, which only fosters alliances among those states rejecting NATO. Indeed, NATO policy played a major role in the rise of the BRICS countries as that grouping is for many states a means of protecting their own sovereignty. Paradoxically then, if there are forces now promoting a multipolar world, the US and its NATO allies must be considered among the most significant. That's all about dialectic. Even states like India and Vietnam are refusing to subordinate themselves to NATO strategy and with its unconditional support to the far-right government of Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel, NATO is losing all moral legitimacy in the global south as it is seen to be complicit in Israeli war crimes. As already mentioned, Public support for a NATO committed to escalation and expansion is crumbling in the West. In Germany, 55% of people reject Ukraine's accession to NATO. The majority opposes 
supplying arms to Ukraine and desires an immediate ceasefire. In the United States, financial aid to Ukraine, 200 billion US dollars so far, has become extremely unpopular. Growing numbers of people want a stop on the flow of money to a system in Kiev, which is not only corrupt, but honors a far-right state cult around the Nazi collaborateur and mass murderer Stefan Bandera. Dear friends, NATO's myths are losing their luster. The alliance's strategies are falling to their own imperial overextension. What we need now is an immediate end to arms deliveries to Ukraine and, at long last, a ceasefire there. Those who seek peace and security for their own populations must halt the aggressive policy of expansion into Asia. Ultimately, the fight against NATO is a fight for one's own sovereignty. As an alliance of client states, Europe is in danger of collapsing. Emancipation, as seen in Latin America, has yet to materialize. A first step would be to stop letting ourselves be played for fools by a military alliance that funds an aggressive strategy with a social war waged by its constitutive governments against its own populations. Therefore, I thank you for your attention and for having me in this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Wow. Okay. Well, we want, we want to thank you so much for coming here. And oh, I, no. uh, well, she's, uh, she's been a part of what's called the uh, NATO parliamentary group for years, yeah. sitting in and hearing everything that NATO is going after. She's also, what, from 2005, you've been a member of the parliament. So that's uh, 20, almost 20 oh, years insider. ago, <laughs> an insider. And also, she's been a part of the parliamentary groups that work with the US, China, US, China and India. India. Yeah. So she's been around the block on all of this stuff. So we thank you so thank much. You. And Thanks also on yeah, Tuesday, on Tuesday night uh, at Busboys and Poets, 5th and K, we'll be having a book launch that will have her new book called The NATO, Der, Der NATO, is that it? NATO Reckoning with the Alliance. Great, and then at the same time, we're going to have David Swanson and Medea Benjamin's book on NATO. So we hope you all will come to NATO to Busboys and Poets on Tuesday at 6 p.m. and be with us then. So thank, thank you. you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Wonderful you. talk. Thank you, and we're going to have our first panel, but first, let me go ahead and introduce, uh, you know, we need to have a little music in these, uh, these very important uh, gatherings. And we have a great singer that's here, uh, Ben Grosscup, who's from Western Massachusetts. And he's been around a long time, and he's got a couple of NATO songs. And he's going to start out, though, with uh, one called uh, Uncle Sam Sh Sees a Shrink. So here comes Ben Gossip. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Uh, my goodness. Um, you know, I've been spending the last 75 years of my life ordering the global system to support my economic interests. And it's tiring. I'm tired. 
I'm sad. I'm, I'm exhausted. God. I, I, you know, I, I've, been, I've been seeking out psychotherapy. Oh, let's get this clear. My name is not Ben Grosscup. My name is Uncle Sam, all right? And uh, thanks for the intro, though, Ann. Um, this is what I told my shrink last night. So what brought me here, shrink, is I started to think that perhaps I've gone into decline. I almost forget when the sun never set on countries whose rules I define. My unrivaled power meant nations would cower and help my vast wealth to accrue. If one wasn't supine or they got out of line, well, I'd just take them out in a coup. And I have by far the best nuclear warheads. Each one is on trigger alert. My hundreds of foreign bases are spread to maintain the control I exert. So, doctor, help me. I can't understand why wielding this power feels pointless and bland. Even with all my arms, my wealth and grandeur, I still feel so insecure. So insecure, so insecure. Even with my grandeur, I feel so insecure. So be frank with me, please. I'm down on my knees. Your words come with weighty credentials. Why am I in this pain? Can you help me regain the status of being essential? It just makes me irate when erstwhile client states demand that I honor their borders. I feel anxious and sick. Check the diagnostic manual of mental disorders. What's the assessment at which you've arrived? And where's it described in this text? Well, I'm paging up there right now in the DSM-5. Just tell me the section heading again. The military industrial complex. Wow, you found my complex. You found my complex. I'll read next from this text where you found my complex. It says the symptoms are fraudsters and hacks win the biggest contracts, building jet fighters and drones. Economies go down in the cities and towns once lenders start calling in loans. Doc, my global franchise runs on free enterprise. You're missing my problems causation. Just help me to see all the threats facing me, like the meddling done by foreign nations. Or do you mean to imply that the very armed forces, key to the power I've known, empty me of my best resources and cause me to feel <laughs> so alone. <laughs> feel so alone. Feel so alone. Don't tell me you've known why I feel so alone. My consultants attested that you were the best, but I clearly see now you're a phony. I pay you too well to be left in this hell of the stress that comes with hegemony. 
This session has only made me feel more ill and thrown your prestige into doubt. You should have known I'm a shining city on a hill. We're done now, and I'm walking out. We thank you all very, very much for, or thank Ben very, very much for uh, that rousing, uh, getting us in the some sort of spirit. <laughs> uh, we are going to have uh, three panels today, three panels, and uh, our very first panel uh, is about global NATO, perspectives from regions of the world, and our moderator is Shem Ken. We'd like for you to come up and your, your panel to come on up. Uh, uh, please come up, and uh, Kim is the uh, coordinator for Asia and the Pacific for Democratic Socialists. So a big hand for her and for the panel. really great to see this room so full of folks who see a brighter future and the end of NATO. Today our panel is What is Global NATO? Perspectives from Regions of the World. And before I start, I just want to say um, thank you to Ms. Dagdalen for her kind of really concise analysis on NATO's kind of illegality and how we see and how the people are realizing that it is in decline and much as those are, are and today have been awakened by Palestine, we see the decline of not just NATO, but empire itself. And I also want to emphasize the distinct extra legality of NATO, that across the world, that even as it breaks international laws, those in the colonized countries, those in the colonized nations, from Latin America to Africa to Korea to Okinawa to all the lands that the US has laid its hands on, we know that international law has meant nothing to these people who are fighting their own fight for justice and forming a different world order today. NATO is the amalgamation of a global northern desire, a thoroughly fascist desire to conquer, to assert a security that takes billions from, other, from our labor, from our livelihoods, for precar precarity. We have, speaker, we have five speakers representing all those beyond the US, ab above which NATO has built its foundation on top of corpses. From the Republic of Korea, from where the US has done one of its experiments, its new strategies for imperialism, to Latin America, to Africa, the first colonial domain of plunder. But from all of these, we are seeing new, exper new experiments of possibility, new experiments of a future beyond NATO. We see African continents expelling French companies. We see Koreans demanding peace. We see Latin Americans experimenting towards socialism to new forms of the state that will free us. And what NATO shows is that a cornered dog bites back. The US the global north is in decline. BRICS has overtaken G7, and we are emerging upon a multipolar world. And for us, those in the US, the question is, do we fight for the decline of empire, or do we stand by as whatever happens will happen and we see US, the US fighting back in the most violent ways possible? For we want not just peace, but we also want the world. I'm going to now introduce our panelists. First, we have Rainer Braun, all the way at the end there. Rainer Braun studied German literature, history, and journalism. Since 1982, he has been actively involved in the German and international peace movement, 
working as executive director for Scientists for Peace and Sustainability and the International Network of Engineers and Scientists for Global Responsibility. Since 2004, Rayner has been working for various projects related to the Einstein Year at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and for the Max Planck Society. From 2006 to uh, 2017, he was the executive director of the IALANA Germany and the VDW, the German Pugwash Group. He was, from 2013 until 2019, one of the two presidents of the International Peace Bureau and the executive director of IPB until 2022. He's one of the speakers of the German peace movement. He was a founding member of the International Network No to War, No to NATO, and is a member of its coordinating committee. Next, we have Jibo Subukwe, if you just want to wave. Jibo Subukwe is a member of the Black Alliance for Peace on the Africa team. He is a former member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party who worked with Kwame Ture on the Political Education Committee. He has published articles as well in the Black Agenda Report. Next, we have KJ No. KJ No is a journalist, political analyst, writer, and teacher specializing in the geopolitics of the Asia Pacific region. He writes for Counterpunch and Dissident Voice. He is special correspondent for KPFA Flashpoints on the pivot to Asia, the Koreas, and the Pacific. Next, we have Chuyam Park. Chuyam Park is an organizer with the organization Noruto for Korean Community Development. Founded in New York City in 1999, Noruto has developed into a national organization focused on organizing the Korean diaspora along anti-imperialist lines. Raised between Korea and the US, Chuyeon has been active in the movement for Korean national liberation for seven years. By day, Chuyeon is the engagement editor at The Real News. And finally, we have Chris Cerise here, who is Code Pink's East Coast and War is Not Green organizer. Chris is a passionate organizer, journalist, and activist proudly hailing from the Bronx, New York, born to Panamanian and Haitian immigrant parents. Graduating in 2021 with a degree in international relations from Global College, they honed their focus on black indigenous studies, delving into the intricacies of identity and social justice, studying in the South and Central America, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands. Transitioning into activism, Chris began organizing against imperialist US foreign policy in Latin America. In 2023, their journalistic pursuits led them to conduct an investigation delving into the histories, visibility, and ongoing struggles of black and indigenous communities throughout the region. Throughout their work, Chris is a fierce advocate for black, indigenous, and queer voices, amplifying narratives often overlooked. Please welcome our speakers today. Oh, and I, I don't know if I introduced myself clearly either, but I'm Shin Kim. I am the current co-chair of the DSA International Committee uh, of the Asia Oceania Subcommittee, and I'm also a member of the Dutol uh, for Korean Community Development. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I believe we have uh, individual remarks by our speakers today. If you all want to kind of come up and speak at the podium for the camera, that would be great. And, uh, Reiner, if you want to start us off. Dear friends, NATO is a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And like Seven was showing, this is not any longer true. NATO is a global NATO. But Europe is playing still an important role in NATO, not only by the numbers of the member organization. And when I'm speaking now about Europe, I have to clarify that in reality, I'm speaking about the European Union and the militarization of the European Union. This means I'm speaking about 27 European countries, but happily, we have more countries in Europe. We have neutral countries like Austria, Switzerland, and Ireland, but we have also Belarusia and Russia. Russia is a European country by culture, by history, and by reality, even when NATO partly denied this reality. So when I'm speaking now about the militarization of the European Union, I'm speaking 
about the development of European Union, which is against the background laws of the European Union, putting down in the Lisboa Treaty. The Lisboa Treaty excludes that the European Union has responsibility for military politics and military policy. But this is without interest for the leading political class in Europe. They are developing these militarization, mainly since 2014, enlarging it with 2022 with the war in Ukraine, but starting it much earlier. What are the key points of the militarization of the European Union? First, like always, these are the military budgets. The military budget of the European Union countries, now the majority of them is spending more than 2% of GDP for the military spending. To say it for 21 countries of the 27 countries are spending more than 2%. And Germany, to say only one example, of the biggest and strongest, economically strongest part of the European Union, is spending in 2024 2.12% for military spending. This is what Germany proudly announced to NATO, 90.6% billion US dollars this year, and it will increase the next years. And Europe, European Union is enlarging these budgets during all the years and will do this in the future. So we are in a rising militarization of the European Union. This military spending includes that the European Union now has own military financial resources. They are partly a part of the budget of the European Union, but they have also special outstanding budgets for military spending. They are so-called the Mil Peace Facility Fund, the Military Defense Fund, which include drones, research, and industrial projects, and start 2021. These are the two parts for spending, mil for military spending in the European Union. What they, are, what they are spending it, they have the so-called PESCO, Permanent Structural Corpor Corporation. These are common arms projects. They have now in the European Union 34 of these projects. All the main point of this project is that several, some countries of Europe are working together to develop these military projects. What are the projects? I will only mention two. Tanks, and they are developing a new air fighter, the so-called air fighter after 2014, which is not only one plane, which is a plane combined with drones and a whole independent military system for war and the same with this European tank. These are two of these projects. They have the European drone as a third project and many, many others. They are also developing with these financial support of the, of, of the countries an own military industry. Have in mind that all the European countries in the past have small military research. You cannot compare it with the militarization of the United States. It was much smaller. But now they are developing an own military industrial complex on the European level, putting the forces of different countries together for common projects. The tank project is a project of Germany and France. The aircraft project is a project of Germany, France, Spain, and maybe in the future other European countries. So they are really, we will really get in the future a military industrial European complex. And we have the same on the research level. In the past, you could not compare the European military research with the US military research. We never had universities which are living for military research and will immediately could stop and closed when there would be no money for military research. In Europe, 
maybe a little bit with the exclusion in the former times of Great Britain, the military research was only limited at the universities. But these changed. We have more military research and we have this combined military research on the European level. But this is the developing part of the militarization of Union. The reality is that the European Union forces are a part of military interventions. We have European Union troops in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have them in Kosovo, we have them partly as part of the NATO troops in Afghanistan and in other countries. So European Union countries are an active part of interventional forces. And that is a part of the policy of the European Union also for the future. And they are a part of the confrontation to Russia. I'm speaking about Ukraine a little bit later. And this means we have European Union and above all German forces in Lithuania. We have 5,000 German soldiers now going to Lithuania and being a part in the military forces in Lithuania. This is against the NATO-Russian agreement, but no one cares about it. And it shows that we are now a part, the European Union is an active part of this confrontation. This also includes that we will have European Union troops, European Union money in Romania, developing now the biggest European base of the United States and NATO in Europe. It will be bigger than Rammstein. I think all of you know Rammstein, but the new military base in Constanta in Romania will be bigger than Rammstein. And you know where you, Romania is lying. It is lying next to the border to Russia. So this is also a part of the European Union militarization. And this development of the bases is funding by European Union money. Partly, not only, but partly. That is the European Union development. European Union is an active part of weapons export. In the past, we had strong, quite strong limitation in exporting weapons. For Germany, it was never allowed to export weapons to region of crisis and war. But this time is over. The European Union is exporting their weapons. And like Seven was saying, you know, the most lovely country for the experts are the dictatorships of the world. They are exporting to Saudi Arabia, to Qatar, and all these authoritarian dictatorships around the world. And we have specific funds now for Ukraine. The European Union is after the United States, or even more than the United States, the biggest funder for military and civilian support for the Ukraine. And you know, the main point of this money, it doesn't go to the people of the country. On one side, it goes to the corruption, and on the other side, it goes for military purposes. And no one in the European Union Expect two presidents or prime ministers are speaking about ceasefire negotiation. I'm not, a fa I'm not in favor of the Hungarian president. I'm a little bit more in favor of the Slovakai president. But both are saying negotiation and ceasefire is needed. And I'm actively supporting that Orban was going to Moscow and was speaking with Putin. And the hate of the European Union leaders against this trip you could see yesterday in the te television. But is the right step when you are not speaking with the other side. You cannot make agreements. And what the European Union is doing is militarization without diplomacy. And that is definitely the wrong way to do. <laughs> what are now strategically, and I think this is more important than the different points how the militarization works. Strategically, the hegemon in NATO has only, is only one country. These are the United States of America. No decision in NATO is possible when the US is not agreeing about it. But Europe is something like a junior partner, trying to be independent in the past or more independent in the past, but this is over. With the Ukrainian war, 
European Union is the union partner under the hegemony of the United States. That is the role Europe is playing in the global NATO. They totally are a part of the political strategy of the United States. This means confrontation on two sides, against Russia and Europe, and against China in the world. But Europe has a specific role, and maybe this role will enlarge under a possible new President Trump. This role is mentioned burden sharing. And the burden sharing <laughs> means the European Union should take more responsibility for wars in Europe, above all for the war in Ukraine. This brings me to the final point. We are in opposition as peace movement to the European Union's militarization from the beginning, from the first moment. We are coordinating our activities with all European peace movements. We have common actions. We were common active in Europe against the NATO summit in Europe and against the European Union militarization. But what we need now is more engagement for ceasefire and negotiations in Ukraine as a key point for stopping the militarization, for coming to a turning point for cooperation, negotiations, and diplomacy. Our work is to stop this militarization and for engaging more people for peace. This is a challenge of the peace movement in Europe. We are doing our best, and we hope that we will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer, for your remarks. Um, the, video, the videographer just wants to give a reminder to our speakers to speak close to the mic for the purposes of video capture. Um, next, we'll have Jibo up to speak. Greetings, everyone. On behalf of the Black Alliance for Peace and its Africa team, I'd like to thank the organizers of this counter summit, this great counter summit, and also for inviting us to make a contribution. Today, US-led NATO has become a global axle in the wheel of the US military industrial complex, which includes 800 military bases around the world in 85 countries. This does not include the 342 military bases in continental US. <clears throat> the US has at least 29 known military bases in Africa. France has 10 and the UK nine, all NATO countries. We can see that the US has far more than any other country and has working relationships with almost all African countries all controlled by the U.S. empire for the purpose of full spectrum dominance, driven by ferocious, the ferocious appetites of corporate capital. Now, full spectrum dominance means U.S. military control over land, sea, air, and space, which is so the so-called fourth dimension of warfare, to protect U.S. interest and investment, quote unquote. Protect, quote unquote, means guaranteeing operational freedom and U.S. interest and investment, quote unquote, means securing a variety of valuable mineral economic resources on the continent of Africa, which produce corporate profits. And this is done with the complicit neocolonial Comprador partners for itself and its allies. The, the economic uh, the forever U.S. war policy at the same time satisfies ec the economic appetite and material resources needed for the military industrial complex, which is an, in an integral part of the whole U.S. corporate capitalist economic system. The late Dr. Walter Rodney accurately described the early foundation of colonial Africa's relationship with NATO in his book, which continues today, by the way, in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. He said, quote, needless to say, in the 1950s, when most Africans were still colonial subjects, they had absolutely no control over the utilization of their soil for militaristic ends. 
Virtually the whole of North Africa was turned into a sphere of operations for NATO with, with bases aimed at the Soviet Union. There could have been easily developed a nuclear war without African people having any knowledge of the matter. The colonial powers actually held military conferences in African cities like Dakar and Nairobi in the early 1950s, inviting whites of South Africa and Rhodesia and the government of the USA. Time and time again, this evidence points to this cynical use of Africa to buttress capitalism economically and militarily, and therefore, in effect, forcing Africa to contribute to its own exploitation. That's really important. The, colon the colonizing countries have managed to do this in several ways, most importantly by ushering in neo-colonial governments that would do the bidding of the former colonizers after nominal independence. Several of Africa's colonizing countries have been part of NATO membership since its founding, such as France, the UK, Portugal, Belgium, and the USA. And therefore, they already had some military bases uh, or installations, at least, in their colonies. The recolonization by way of neocolonialism was largely successful in spite of the fierce opposition and resistance by anti-colonial liberation movements and leaders. This class struggle also manifests itself in the Organization of African Unity, founded in 1963, where there were two contending groups of countries, one group that wanted to remain dependent with a dependent relationship of the co with the colonizing countries, and on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, those that opposed uh, the continued colonial relationship. To enable the acceptance of the idea of, ben of a benevolent NATO, the colonial powers knew that they had to convince and recruit a neo-colonial class of indigenous Africans who would do their bidding. This divide played itself out in the national liberation movements between those that were friendly to imperialist forces versus those who wanted a real break from colonialism. The great Kwame Nkrumah explains in his book, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism, that the wide array of methods employed by neocolonialism ranging are ranging from economics, politics, religious, ideological, and cultural spheres. To do this, NATO works hand in hand with other mechanisms of imperialism, like the CIA, which is an instrumental, uh, which was instrumental in the coup against the Kwame Nkrumah government, and and the murder of Patrice Lumumba in which case the UN forces also were used as a tool to abort the anti-colonial government of Patrice Lumumba in 1960. Countries, other countries that offered organized resistance to colonialism and neocolonialism included, for example, the Portuguese colonies, as was mentioned. As mentioned, Portugal was also one of the founding 12 NATO members. The great freedom fighter of Africa, Amilcar Cabral, called Portugal a rotten appendage of imperialism. He explained that Portugal, as the most underdeveloped country in Western Europe, would never be able to launch three colonial wars at the same time in Africa without the help of NATO. Furthermore, NATO, a creation of the US, uses Portugal and its colonies as part of the larger objective of domination of Africa and the world. Portugal concluded a vicious world, a, a vicious war against its colonies in Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, Angola, and Mozambique, much like the U.S. did in Vietnam. In both cases, colonizing powers used the most modern weapons, including napalm, cluster bombing, campaigns, killing thousands against guerrilla armies that refused to bow down. The Portuguese dictator Caetano was forced to give up economic interest in, in Angola to some of the NATO powers in exchange for, the NATO, for NATO armaments and supplies. 
Yet, in spite of that, Portugal still lost the war against the heroic anti-colonial forces. The U.S. NATO and U.S. Africa Command, which is an appendage of the U.S. NATO military command structure, all played a devastating role in the destruction of Libya in 2011. It is important to highlight this because it offers some important lessons. First, U.S. imperialism and its NATO lackeys do not tolerate any country that charts an independent path of development, one that refuses to cow down to U.S. hegemonic, hegemonic interests. Secondly, it also demonstrates how NATO can work hand in hand with other U.S. Western dominated world structures like the United Nations. In 2011, the UN Resolution 1973 gave political authorization for a quote unquote no fly zone and a blockade of Libya to implement its purported quote unquote responsibility to protect some citizens, which ultimately resulted in the destruction of Africa's most prosperous country. U.S.-led NATO forces launched a bombing campaign that lasted seven months and killed tens of millions of people, civilians, and tens, in tens of billions of dollars in property and infrastructure damage. This shows how, although U.S.-led NATO sometimes uses the United Nations for political cover, it has no problem illegally overstepping its mandate, its UN mandate, to commit crimes against humanity and achieve its regime change goals. The illegal US-NATO war on Libya will be remembered as one of history's greatest crimes. Indirect and direct cooperation between NATO, the UN, the African Union, and the Arab League shows the expansive and deeply woven web of US and NATO reach. We would be remiss if we didn't include the example of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The DRC has the highest death rate of all with some six million people killed when Uganda and Rwanda, which are US proxies, invaded that country in 1996, all to ensure the uninterrupted plunder of Africa's strategic raw materials, such as coal, cobalt, tantalum, chromium, coltan, uranium, etc. These minerals are strategically important, not only for cell phones, but also for the technologies that drive the military industrial complex. Those mentioned here are but a small sampling of NATO AFRICOM's bloody works in Africa. The U.S. AFRICOM continues to operate under the guise of quote unquote training and humanitarian peacekeeping assistance. However, jihadist terrorist violence on the African continent has increased dramatically since the founding of AFRICOM and NATO's destruction of Libya, resulting in civilian casualties and instability. The West has used this violence as a pretext and justification for the, continued, for the continued use of AFRICOM. As the Black Alliance for Peace's AFRICOM Watch Bulletin reported, since the founding of AFRICOM, there's also been an increase in AFRICOM trained soldiers, in coups by AFRICOM trained soldiers. Consistent with what Nkrumah and Rodney and others warned of in the 60s and the 70s, NATO continues today in the form of U.S. AFRICOM facilitating wars, instability, and the corporate pillage of Africa. AFRICOM's hip hypocrisy also explains why there's been resistance by African countries to host the AFRICOM headquarters in Africa, forcing it to stay in Germany. Their experiences with NATO and AFRICOM ensure skepticism of its self-proclaimed noble motives. The US NATO death toll inflicted on the African continent makes any claim of concern for human rights hypocritical. The Black Alliance for Peace calls for the dismantling of NATO, AFRICOM, and all its imperialist structures. AFRICOM. <laughs> 
Afri Africa and the rest of the world cannot be free until all peoples have a right of sovereignty and the right to live, in f to live free of domination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shimo. And please check out the Black Alliance for Peace. Their posters are around the hall. Next, we'll have KJ No speaking. I was going to show some images, but I was told that there's a possibility that if I show these images, our live stream might be cut off. So I'm not going to show them, but I'll describe them to you. <laughs> so did anybody watch the presidential debates? <laughs> I say presidential and debate. There was a little section where they had a little golf policy dialogue. Do you remember that? Okay. Now, the question is, why are they discussing golf handicaps and golf scores rather than public policy or war or peace or, I don't know, things like that, right? Uh, but uh, there's a logic to this because if you go, and this was one of the images that I wanted to show, was that if you look at a map of golf courses, the density of golf courses by the million, <coughs> and then you look at a map of NATO countries, members, partner countries, these maps coincide by about 90%. <laughs> I'm not kidding, look it up. And you can also look up the map of countries that recognize Palestine. And that map also coincides. And if you look at a map of countries that supported the UN anti-Nazism resolution, you'll also see that there is a correspondence. So there's a pattern here. And the pattern is coming back to the idea of golf. You know, a golf course can feed 3,000 people if it were turned into farmland, or it can entertain a handful. But why feed hungry people when you can amuse the well-fed, right? That's their logic. And if you don't believe me, NATO has its own golf club. You can actually do a web search, you'll see that there is a club where NATO members can play golf. Uh, and the distribution of US bases corresponds also to the distribution of golf courses. But let me tell you something that is really wow, <laughs> really scary. <clears throat> the ruling elite, they never deprive themselves of anything. They never give up anything. So when they give up something, you know they are serious about it. When they give up their golf courses and turn them into missile bases, you know they are serious about war. And I'm serious, dead serious. Uh, those of you who know anything about the SAD, the FAD system in South Korea, you know that one of the most beautiful golf courses in the world was turned into a THAAD missile base. Currently, on the first island chain along the Okinawan Islands, Yo Yonaguni and uh, other small islands adjacent to Taiwan, there are golf courses that are being turned yet again into missile bases. So we know that the ruling elite are dead serious about war. And we, we've known this. I mean, you can see there's a deliberate pattern when it comes to war. The first thing that they do is they wage information warfare. That is, they manufacture consent for war through demonization and hate mongering. We're far into that. But the information war is the pre-kinetic dimension of war. 
And then they start around by shaping or setting the theater. And we're talking about they create coalitions, they pre preposition troops and ammunition, they start rehearsing very intensive exercises. NATO has just done a 120 day exercise. I've been in the military. Military exercises usually only last five, 10 days. This is a 120 day exercise uh, in Europe but also in, in, for example, in South Korea. South Korea had 200 days nonstop of military exercises, back to back, including 20 exercises that involved uh, strategic nuclear bombing rehearsals. So once again, I'm telling you, this is very, very serious. In South Korea, they're actually rehearsing uh, the transfer and uh, the capture and transfer of POWs. That's how granular these exercises are. So the US is escalating to war with China. NATO is an integral part of this escalation because it is the, they're the goons of Western imperialism. They're the armed wing of Western imperialism. And my uh, comrade Ben Norton uh, has compared, or he's pointed out that the NATO leadership some of the NATO leadership have been Nazis. You know that the Nazi leadership became the NATO leadership. And so here again, the Nazis are at it again. Now the US has been preparing for war since 2008. Uh, it created a doctrine of war in 2009. It was called air-sea battle. Does anybody know what the precursor to air-sea battle is? It's called air land battle. They're not very original. <laughs> air land battle was the uh, NATO doctrine of war against the Soviet Union. <coughs> Does anybody know where air land battle came from? It came from the Yom Kippur War. It is Israeli war doctrine. It is deep battle extended in space and time where nowhere is safe, there is no front or rear, there is no safety for civilians. It involves deep penetrating attacks on infrastructure. And we commonly know air land battle as shock and awe. The US has been preparing shock and awe for China for 15 years now, and they've actually calendared dates. General Minahan says 2025, or his gut says 2025, and Admiral Davidson says 2027, somewhere in that range. So we have dates, we have doctrine, we are decoupling economies. Uh, there is currently a proxy NATO war with Ukraine. And originally the idea was war with Russia. China was supposed to be the main dish. War with Russia was supposed to be an appetizer or a dessert. There was a kind of a back and forth among the ruling elite. Uh, but uh, the Newland faction won out and they wanted to barrel through Ukraine through Russia, uh, because Russia is just a gas station masquerading as a country, right? That didn't turn out so well. But anyway, NATO as the arm of US imperialism is building all kinds of alliances, in particular what they call the uh, ITPP or the Indo-Pacific Four. This is Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Korea. They're all attending uh, the NATO conference. Yun so -gyal is going to Washington right now as we speak. And here's the thing. We know that the Western Empire began with genocide. It has been unending genocide. It lives on genocide, thrives on it, and it is now ending with genocide, a horrific genocide in Palestine. And this is why we have to stop it. It's time to stop NATO. It's time to stop the genocides. Now the empire is collapsing. It's like a drunk at a bar. And when the bar is closing, it doesn't want to go home, right? It wants one more fight, right? Its credit cards have been canceled. It's struck out with everybody, but it's not going to go home. It's going to have one big fight. And the drunk, the Western imperial elite, they're drunk with power. They're drunk with 500 years of power. But 
it is now time for NATO to close shop and go home. We're sick of the genocides. We're sick of the violence. So that will be our work. This will be our work over the next few days, over the next months, over the next years, is to shut down this genocidal machine. It's time. Thank you. Thank you so much, KJ. We'll now pass it over to Jihan. Thanks, Shin. Good morning, everyone. How are we all feeling today? You flew, some of you flew across the world to fight NATO. I ask you how you're doing, and I hear, huh. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. I want to extend uh, my gratitude and the gratitude of Norutol to the organizers of Noda NATO Yes to Peace. Uh, also want to just uh, extend respect to all the fellow panelists who've already appeared before me. Uh, my name is Chu Hyun. I'm here representing Norutol for Korean Community Development. Uh, Shin gave a little bit of an introduction to our organization. If you're not familiar, Norutol uh, is an organization of Korean diaspora and our comrades based here in the United States. And for more than 20 years, uh, actually, I guess this year is our 25th year, we have been organizing and mobilizing uh, to raise consciousness of US imperialism in our homeland, to build people to people ties between uh, not only diaspora youth here in the US, but also among the US left with people who are deeply involved in the struggle for liberation from imperialism in Korea whether that's on the southern side of the peninsula or on the northern side. Throughout our history, we've organized 11 delegations to the DPRK or to North Korea. Uh, that work has been paused for the last seven years because uh, during, in 2017, the United States imposed a unilateral travel ban preventing US passport holders from visiting the DPRK, which still stands to this day. So given our organization's long history of focus on questions of peace and demilitarization in Korea, we naturally see the global expansion of NATO as a paramount threat to peace and sovereignty in the world today. And we are especially concerned by Korea's role as a sort of ground zero in the formation of Asian NATO. And that's something I wanna get into more today. Now as uh, Pretty much every speaker who's come before me has already established NATO as an alliance really has no defensive purpose. NATO is just a mechanism for the United States to weld together the various powers of the Northern Atlantic behind support for imperialist wars around the world, which primarily serve to uphold the, U the US's financial and military hegemony on the planet. Now today, the greatest threat to that hegemony comes from China. And the reason for this is because China has achieved a combination of economic prosperity and political independence that allows it to challenge uh, the US on the global stage. Uh, and not only to assert its own independence, but really to provide other countries with an alternative path to development than through the United States, the IMF, the World Bank, the entire Bretton Woods system. So back in 2020, the NATO Secretary General released a report called NATO 2030 which identified China as a systemic rival to the Western Bloc that NATO represents. Now, it's definitely curious that NATO would have anything to say about China at all. I think this is a very informed audience, but in case anyone is not aware, China is not in the Atlantic. <laughs> I will say that once again, China is not in the Atlantic. So, what that signals to us is that the US ruling class has reached a point where it sees war with China as both inevitable and desirable because this is the primary way to maintain its position of dominance in the world system. Therefore, there is a need for an Asian NATO similar to China. Asia is also mostly not in the Atlantic. 
So what is Asian NATO? When we talk about Asian NATO, what we mean is the formation of a new military bloc in Asia and the Pacific, which is dominated by the United States. This idea is not necessarily new. It's something that the US has sought in the region ever since the very beginning of the Cold War. And the US has also had a very large permanent military presence in its vassal states across East Asia and Oceania since the end of World War II. But what's changing now is that these vassal states, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, et cetera, are being brought into increasingly larger alliances that link them to one another in addition to the US. And the result is the formation of a sort of super alliance, the gradual building of a single uh, unit that thinks and acts like one army. So far, we have a few building blocks of the system in place. We have AUKUS, which is the security pact between Australia, the United Kingdom, not in Asia, and the US. We have the Quad, which is primarily a security dialogue between Japan, India, Australia, and the US, which recently conducted naval exercises with the Philippines. We have JACUS, Japan, the United States, and Korea, which are forming a new trilateral military alliance. And then we have Five Eyes Plus, which refers to the Five Eyes countries that engage in an intelligence dialogue, specifically with Japan and South Korea, concerning military developments on the Korean Peninsula, so the DPRK or North Korea, and China. And what we can clearly see is that the purpose of this alliance is to encircle China militarily and not only prepare for, but actively provoke a situation of war, some kind of confrontation that can be used to bring about a collapse of China's political system and extend the reach of US imperialism in the region. But where does Korea really fit into this? It might not be immediate, uh, immediately obvious, but the point I want to argue today is that Korea is the keystone of this rising Asian NATO. What I mean by that is that Korea has become the essential piece of the puzzle that makes Asian NATO possible in the first place. And that's different from understanding the objective of Asian NATO, which is still primarily centered around China. Additionally, Korea is now the most volatile flashpoint in this new Cold War. It's the place where a confrontation is most likely because it's the place where the US is making its boldest threats and escalations. So because of those reasons, there is a very urgent need for the anti-war movement, the anti-imperialist movement, to gain a better understanding of the Korean situation and its strategic centrality to both the imperialist forces and correspondingly, we, the anti-imperialist forces of the world. The first thing we need to understand is that in the last few months, there has been a paradigm shift in Korea. For more than half a century, the DPRK, North Korea's approach to the question of security in Korea was primarily premised on the idea of peaceful, independent reunification, seeing the ROK, the Republic of Korea, the South, as a partner in that process. That era is now over. At the start of this year, there was a speech delivered by General Secretary Kim Jong-un in which he clarified that the strategy of peaceful reunification would be departed from because 50 years of practice, 50 years of real world experience had demonstrated that it was no longer viable. What was the reason the DPRK found this approach no longer viable? It is because of the magnitude and the severity of US war threats that are unfolding in Korea at this moment. KJ previously mentioned that last year, 2023, there were 200 days of consistent war exercises in Korea conducted by the US military. Over 20 of those exercises involve the use of nuclear capable weapon systems. That's nuclear submarines, it's aircraft carriers, it's strategic bombers. But beyond that, we also need to understand that there has been a long war on Korean independence, a long war on the DPRK that stretches all the way back to the end of World War II. As you may be aware, the Korean War ended in an armistice in 1953, not a peace treaty. So as a result, in a legal and in a military sense, that war is still a reality. 
as part of that war, there's the economic war that the U.S. wages in the form of, of sanctions against the DPRK. As part of that war as well, there are these uh, military threats, these constant war exercises that we've named. And as a result, the DPRK has made the decision to shift towards a uh, strategy that primarily emphasizes deterrence rather than diplomacy, which was the case for 30 years. In the 1990s up till now, the DPRK engaged in three rounds of negotiations processes with the United States. Even going as far back as 1974, they were sending letters to the US Congress asking for a peace treaty. They have looked back on all those consecutive experiences and determined we can no longer pursue the strategy. We simply have to focus on our own defense at this time. So that's brought the situation in Korea to a boiling point. And it's a very tense situation, but the US is simply not scaling back on its threats. So far this year already, we had a military exercise in the spring, which involved 12 nations, including NATO countries, that deployed their militaries to Korea to, uh, to participate in these war provocations. The United States, Japan, and South Korea just finished a round of military exercises in Korea as well. This August, the US will conduct its annual flagship exercises called Ulji Freedom Shield. As part of that suite of exercises that's going to occur in that month, there will be nuclear war exercises in Korea. We are already watching a genocide unfold in Gaza. We already know that there are multiple other genocides that are playing out or have played out in recent years. The famine and the counter-revolution in Sudan, the pillaging of the Congo, the United States is behind all these things. This is not enough to whet the appetite of the ruling class. They are actively rehearsing for new genocides, new processes of annihilation that they want to implement, not in the distant future, but in the next few years. That's what makes Korea particularly significant at this moment, because it is a place where the US is, in the region, the US is trying many, many different ways to provoke China to instigate war. The DPRK is a separate entity, of course. But the question of peace and war in the region can't be disconnected to the question of peace and war in the peninsula. And so by actively provoking a situation there that's building up towards a regional conflict that will involve these other primary rivals that the United States has identified. So to end today, we wanna make you aware of our US out of Korea campaign. This is something that we are launching uh, in just a few weeks, July 27th. And the reason for that we're launching this is because we recognize that there is a need for active domestic political opposition to US war maneuvers. Right now, the US enjoys complete operational freedom in Korea. Part of that is because there are very few voices from inside this country that are speaking up in an organized fashion to denounce what is going on, to make masses of people aware of what is happening. So we're introducing this campaign effort as part of the work to be able to do that. And I realize I'm far over time, so I'm gonna cut off here, but happy to talk about this further with anyone later today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shuhyun, and um, go ahead and check out Dodotol on socials. It's N-O-D-U-D-D-U-T-D-O-L for more news on the campaign. Dodutol, N-O-D-U-T-D-O-L. And finally, we have Chris speaking, so please give them a warm welcome. Hello, my name is Chris Sarisi, I am with Code Pink. And as my comrades before me said, <laughs> Um, as my comrades before me said, the title of the North Atlantic Treaty is, is a false narrative to mislead the public that this organization is strictly for a strictly an alliance between the United States and Europe. And as you have heard, that is so far from the truth. The impact of this alliance continues to be felt from Asia to Africa to Latin America. And if anyone from Latin America can tell you the history of US milita militarization in Latin America is insanely violent, insanely intrusive, 
and the cause of a lot of the issues and crises that we see right here within the belly of the beast. There's plenty of examples ongoing, future and in the past that we have seen that NATO would just be another tool to follow through on US agenda that they have permeated through many of the regional organizational structures within Latin America. Black Alliance for Peace has done a lot of work highlighting how immersive this, this violent US agenda is in organizations like the core group, like the OSA, like the Caribbean um, Organization of Caribbean States. This US agenda has no intention for peace and only violence. Every talk that the United States has entered into for, for fighting for peace has been dead. As my comrade in Korea said, a lot of these nations have exhausted peace talks because they understand that entering into talks with the United States goes nowhere because it is just, it is just a, false, um, a, a false olive branch to just go into military intervention. So NATO is not just Europe. NATO is a tool that the US is trying to use to activate military intervention all over the globe whenever they see fit, for whatever reason, whenever they want to. The US right now is in talks to bring Argentina as well into NATO. If no one knows, Argentina just selected their own far right leader, Millet, who intends to bring NATO, is welcoming NATO with open arms. And as we've seen in many other Latin American countries, these places that the US wants to create military bases in, that they want to have military operations in, are not empty. They are not empty plots of land. They're not empty bases. They have people. And these people, more often than not, are black and indigenous people. We've seen it in Colombia. We've seen it in, in Cuba. We've seen it in Venezuela. These are black and indigenous people that the US plans on testing and building these military bases on. Right now, Millet in Argentina, who is very much open arms trying to accept NATO, plans on doing this. He will tell you, he will tell you that these lands are empty and barren, while at the same time trying to strip these lands from indigenous communities that are already there. And they are really, they are openly willing to discredit the right to land that these people have to build these military bases. And then as we see on the ground in the United States within the belly of the beast, when everyone talks, of this migrant crisis without talking about the impact that US foreign policy has on this ongoing migrant crisis that is triggered by the US behavior, is triggered by the US agenda of going into these places, displacing thousands of people, thousands of people from their homes that then leave. There is such a grassroots impact to NATO. Yes, there are billions of dollars in, in aircrafts and nuclear testing, which are all real impacts, but there is a, such a grassroots level of displacing people from their land that the US at best, at best they see as a temporary roadblock to their agenda for NATO. This, this fundamental push of moving people off their land creates such a ripple effect, a ripple effect of resistance, a ripple effect of, of occupation, um, a, a ripple effect of displacement across the Americas, not just, not just in, it, the idea of a North Atlantic is not just Atlantic. China is not in the Atlantic. Korea, not in the Atlantic. Africa, not in the Atlantic. It's, it's not just Europe. And, I, and it's really important that as people who are organizing and counter to a US agenda that we understand that this narrative is meant to mislead the public. This narrative of, of Russia as our enemy, of China as our enemy, is meant to classify anybody who challenges the US as an enemy. The US is going, it's right now Colombia is NATO's number one partner in Latin America, something that's passed on from a previous administration. And Colombia is a, is a really good example of how initially you have to attack grassroots local communities first. You have to push these indigenous and African communities off their land first to then perpetuate this large scale agenda of US militar militarization, militarization <laughs> in the region. And it's not just Colombia. If the US is able to, if, if the US is able to immerse itself in Latin America, if NATO is able to become a military tool of US agenda, it will wreak havoc in the region. Right now we're seeing in Haiti a US funded intervention, a US funded invasion of a Latin American country using foreign militaries 
And that's exactly what NATO will continue to be in the region if we continue down this path. The United States is trying to use NATO to legitimize this military intervention globally. They believe if they do it under the guise of NATO, it'll bring a sort of legitimacy that this is okay, this intervention is okay, we're, we're bringing peace through guns and war to regions that are ungovernable and in, in, insta, in insta, instability, and full of instability and unstable places. These are not unstable places. The US will deem a terrorist anybody who goes against them, anyone who's fighting the US agenda, the US will deem a terrorist and fight against. While creating a resistance through this displacement, while going into countries, taking people off their land, creating resistance where there wasn't, they create their own enemy. And then they label that and they say it's justifiable that we go into these communities, that we displace these people, that we test nuclear arms for enemies that don't even exist. They do not exist. And so I really think it's important to understand that, that this title of North Atlantic Treaty is meant to mislead the public. It is not just the North Atlantic. It is anyone who goes against the US agenda. It is not just Russia. It is not just China. It's Haiti as well. It's Palestine as well. Our resistance to US imperialism makes us an enemy. It does not matter. It does not matter where we are. It does not matter what alliance we fall under. Anybody who goes against this will be deemed a, a, a threat to the state. So I think it's important to understand the grassroots level that, this, that NATO has, not just in Europe, but in Latin America. Anybody, anybody, anybody going against the state is a threat. Now, the US has continued to legitimize and delegitimize any state that goes against them. And so we're seeing now, in Haiti in particular, I really want to use Haiti as an example because it's, that's, that's how we do it. It's, NATO is going to be a military tool used to carry out the agenda that is created by the core group, another organization backed by the United States. These groups are, uh, are operating without any say of the countries they're operating in. So when we were talking about the core group, we were talking about a group that does not have any Haitians inside of it, that they are now following through on a military occupation through. And so it's really important not just to see NATO as this global occupying force, but it's working in alliance with regional bodies that are, that are promoting these anti-grassroots these anti narratives. So it's, it's the core group saying that, Haitian, that Haiti needs an invasion, and then soon it'll be NATO that will carry out that invasion. And so it's really important to stop it now Stop it while we have the power to stop it. Stop it before it already is working in alliance with these, with these regional bodies backed by the US. It's important to fight for the autonomy of the people who, will, who are living on these soon to be bases. These bases that the US plans to build are not empty. They are not without people that are already on them. And it takes pushing people off of their lands to build these bases, to test these nuclear weapons. You have to push the people that are already on it out. And the US does not really see that as a difficult problem. They do not. But the minute they push people off their land to build these NATO bases to test these nuclear arms is the minute they create a resistance. And so it's really important to stop it now to create, to stop the impact of already mass displacement that we're seeing from US backed militarization. It's so important that we see these grassroots impacts of these communities living on the ground in Colombia, in Cuba, in Haiti, that are then forming and organizing together to stop NATO. And if they're stopping the, the, the entrance of NATO right now on the ground, we have a responsibility as people in the belly of the beast, four or five blocks from the capital where they're, where they're planning these things. We have a responsibility to say, you cannot do this, we are here, you have pushed enough people out of Haiti. You have pushed enough people out of Colombia that now we're here. Now we're here because we have no other choice to be. And we're telling you to stop. So I really want, I really, really, really am imploring people to keep that in mind that these bases are not empty. Where they build, are, there are people living on these lands who have lived on these lands for centuries. And so we protect, we fight for those on their land, we fight for those who have been forced out of their land, who are now in the belly of the beast, saying we refuse to leave again, we refuse to be pushed out anymore. We refuse to have any more of these built, we refuse to have more displacement come, 
there is there is no need to have a military base because you are creating enemies. The more military bases you create, the more nuclear arms you test, the more enemies you create, the more of a resistance you create. And we don't want we don't want resistance, we want peace. We want continued peace in the region and building a military base does not say peace, it is preparation for war. It is preparation for war and it's not our war, it is the US's war. It is not our war to fight, but it is our war, it is a war that we are impacted by. So I really want folks to keep that in mind. These lands are not empty. These people are not without, are not without a home. We live on these lands. There, every, every bomb you test, there are communities impacted by the air, by the land, by the soil, the air we breathe, the water we drink are all impacted by these tests. It is not happening in isolation to everything else. These bombs are not being tested in vacant areas. There are people, there are people in every corner. When Millet talks about bringing NATO and bringing military bases, what he is not saying is that it takes pushing thousands of indigenous people off their land, off their land to build that base. Taking away their inherent right to land to build that base, to test those bombs. It is not happening in isolation. It is not happening on empty territory. It is happening to people. It's happening to people who live there, who are from there, that can no longer be there because of this US agenda of violence, of indiscriminate violence, happening not just in Europe, not just with Russia, but with everyday people, everyday people who have woken up and fallen asleep on the same territory that they can no longer do because all of a sudden this new NATO military complex has to be built. And it is not just Colombia, it's, it's in Atlanta, it's Cop City. It's Cop City where these large military bases that are destroying the land, destroying access to water, destroying the largest forest in the south that we no longer have access to. People live here, people have lived here from before and after. We will continue to be on this land and we will continue to reject all military occupation, military projects, military testing that the US has no consideration for, no consideration. At best, at best, they would see us as a temporary roadblock in these sort of constructions. It is not just NATO, it is not just, it is not just China, it is all of the Americas, it is all of the global south, it is all oppressed, colonized people. So keep that in mind, thank you for having me. Thank you so much to our speakers. So we have about 15 minutes for audience questions and some discussion between our panelists. If you do have a question, please just go ahead, shout it out. Say, you know, if there's someone on the panel you'd like to answer it. If not, y'all can decide which ones to tackle. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll open up the floor. Back there. I have a wireless microphone here if you'd like to use it. Just don't point it at the speaker because we'll get feedback. Okay. Yeah, KJ, I was wondering if you could outline for the audience when you and I spoke uh, last year about the actual bases and how that lines up for the geographical encirclement of China. Absolutely, thank you. Um, if you look at US bases, they are arrayed in an arc around China. There are about 330 or 400, depending on how you count them. Uh, and they follow a chain from Japan to South Korea to Jeju Island. Jeju Island is where the Nanjing massacre start for those who are history buffs. Uh, and then they come along the uh, Okinawan or the Rukyu Island chain. Uh, Taiwan currently is being prepped with US troops and US munitions. They are US special forces three miles from uh, the Chinese mainland on Jinmen Island. And then this continues on into the Philippines and then all around through the South China Sea. So it's almost a perfect noose. In fact, that's what they refer to it. They say it is a perfect noose. Very, very deliberate. And you can see the nonstop exercises that are being uh, prepared there and also the constant provocations. It's like the US is driving into the paint over and over again in order to draw the foul so that it can pile in and start the war. Do 
Yes, hi. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to have a panel discussion on, on, the, on Iran or West Asia or Middle East. Do you know what is the plan for Iran? Is Iran going to fall in any of these, um, I guess, plans on vi violence in the future? I was born in Iran. That's what I'm asking. In this, uh, in the scheme. Okay. You know, I think this is a totally interesting discussion which we have. have. You know, the aggression against Iran will continue. Above all, when Trump will be president, then this is a region, and his security advisor, maybe his future security advisor, announced that he's preparing a war against Iran. And I think they will do everything to stop the activities of Iran in the BRICS coalition and in the Shanghai coalition. And they know that Iran is a key partner of the fight against the Israel aggressions. So they will do everything to weaken Iran. They will enlarge the sanctions and maybe they will also go to war. The biggest problem is that Israel is not able to make three wars against Lib Lebanon, against Gaza, and against Iran. That is even for Israel and the support of the US too much. So they have to concentrate their own forces. But the key enemy for them in the region is Iran. So we will have everything to do to reduce the influence of Iran in the region, and this includes, from my perspective also, that they will go for a war with Iran. I'll just add uh, one more comment to that. Remember, <coughs> as the United States was attacking Iraq and Afghanistan, in Washington, the discourse was that only little boys go to Iraq real men go to Iran. They were planning war with Iran. This has been on the agenda for a long time. And you have to understand the thinking of the ruling neocon elite. They see this, in the words of Kurt Campbell, as one unified field. They see it as one large battle, one large war with multiple battlefronts. And Kurt Campbell has said <coughs> that he, he is going to unleash a magnificent symphony of death in Asia. Magnificent symphony of death. Um, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm Sam Husseini, I'm an independent journalist. Um, I'm wondering how much there is a threat of hot war, which is very real to a large extent, but also just simply the threat has a massive effect. Uh, for example, I've been working, I was working on getting the genocide convention invoked uh, against Israel, which South Africa did. The next stage of that should be the U UN meeting in the General Assembly under Uniting for Peace to put teeth into that because the US would veto anything at the UN at the Security Council. That hasn't happened. And I think part of the reason that that hasn't happened is that the US and NATO basically have a gun pointed at anybody's head which, who might push that. So the, the threats that we're talking about are not only the possibilities of future war, but are enabling uh, a current war so that you can have China and Russia and other countries making decent statements at the UN, but they won't put their we, you know, their shoulder to the wheel, as South Africa did to some extent, because they know that their interests are threatened in some ways, and that there's a constellation of threats and possible collusions at different levels. Can we, can we get a rephrase of the, the question? The trend towards hot war 
is very, very real. I say this as somebody who's been in the military, I'm talking to people who are in the military, the level of granular preparation is so extraordinary. When you have this kind of preparation and momentum, war is certainly in the cards. But I think this notion of hot war, kinetic versus uh, non-kinetic war is actually is a misnomer because it's war all the time. It's war all the time and we just see it in different phases and different phases are highlighted. The genocide has been ongoing. The genocide of the Palestinians is not something new. It's simply, it's a chronic state that has flared into an acute state, but essentially it has been ongoing. And the same thing with all the other hotspots around the world. As I said, they see it as one unified field. Now, inside that st structure are different countries maneuvering and negotiating, trying to de-escalate. I'm sure there's a lot of horse trading. Uh, I think that you know the international system, broken as it is, is trying, at least the global south, is trying to prevent further escalation into hot war. But as I said, the US is like the, the drunk at the bar. The bar is closing, they wanna go out with a fight, and this is what we're facing right now. I also wanna add that uh, NATO and the US continuously fight various grades of war, l like a low-grade war. For example, sanctions is, is a, a form of war. Sanctions uh, on Zimbabwe, for example, have killed 9,000 people. Venezuela, they've killed tens of thousands of people just through sanctions. So, you know, war comes in various uh, stages and, and degrees of quality. And the U.S. with its allies are continually fighting various stages of war. So when you say hot war, there, there are pre other phases of war that cause just as much death, or some death anyway, as a hot war does. So I just wanted to add that. Okay, um, I also wanted to just back that. I think, and before you have a, a full rage war, however you want to define that, you have to first build bases, you have to first create uh, infrastructure in these places. And in order to do that, you have to remove the people already there. And that is a war for the people living there. When you suck out any sort of ability to live in a space, that is a war. When you force thousands of hundreds of people off of their land to then construct whatever infrastructure you need to conduct a hot war, that is war on the people. When we talk about this, you ha we have to understand, in order to get to a place where you're able to conduct full-fledged war, you have to create infrastructure before that. And that is a war on the people living there. And I think it's, it's, it's really founded in this sense of, of deep dehumanization, deep-seated uh, anti-blackness, anti-indigenousness, to not consider that a war for people when you suck out all livability out of a place. When you make a place so unlivable to force people off of a land, that is war. That is war for the people there. And I think that is something we should start considering to be war, uh, so we act accordingly. But that is hot, that is violence. And then when you, when you push people off of land to places you know they don't have resources, when you push a bunch of Venezuelans to New York, when you know you're not gonna provide them resources, but you've also made their country unlivable, that is war. That is war on such a large international scale when you are able to push hundreds of thousands of people out of a place. That is something only war can do. And so I think if we start considering that as hot war, then the way we approach this is also, it just changes radically because that is a war on people. Bad responses? Question is, for me the question is not if we have war or not in the world. We have, according to the Swedish Peace Research Institute, we have 20 wars and more than 200 armed conflict in the world. That is the brutal reality. The question for me is, if we are coming from all these kinds of war to a great war, including nuclear weapons, which is a third world war, and I think according to my neighbor, we are quite nearby to this situation. And that is the reality of danger we are facing. 
And that is the reality when we are discussing about NATO today. We are not discussing about poor wars. We have wars. We are discussing about the danger for a big war in the world which really destroyed the whole world and the people on the planet. And this question of, are we talking about kinetic hot war? Are we talking about the threat of war? I think we need to understand that alliances like NATO, the globalization of NATO, their purpose is to make hot war more feasible for the United States. The US is not talking about conducting a war in Texas. They are not talking about having some bloody all out battle in Ohio. They're talking about doing it in Iran. They're talking about doing it in the Pacific. They are actively doing it in Ukraine, right? So through the formation of these alliances, what the US is able to do is to access the resources, the bodies, the land of other peoples, and mobilize them for the purpose of war. That is the thing that makes the US much bolder. That is the thing that raises the risk of hot war actually breaking out as well. Because we know the US cannot defeat any of these so-called adversaries on its own. The US actually doesn't have a great record of winning wars, at least in this century. <laughs> they need these alliances. They need these big teams to make it possible. And one point I wasn't able to address earlier was in the case of the Pacific, in the case of East Asia, I mentioned before that Korea is very important there. I got into a little bit of you know how the continuing low-grade conflict in Korea is a big part of that. Another big part of it is the role of the South Korean military. South Korea is the largest military ally that the US has in the region, by far. 600,000 active duty troops, millions in reserves, all of them under the operational wartime command of the United States. That is several orders more than Japan can offer. It's more than 10 times what Australia can offer. It's more than three times what Taiwan or the Philippines have available. So when we talk about Asian NATO, when we talk about any conflict in the Pacific, that means that the bulk of those troops will be coming from South Korea, which was also the case when the US fought its war in Vietnam. So we have to look at these alliances as, and you know, this militarization as the, as the build up to the kinetic war, as the war before the war, but also as a way for the empire to diffuse the costs that it will impose on citizens inside the belly of the beast and also on its own coffers. It's gonna defray those onto other governments, other people, other territories. For one last question, so. I think this uh, panel has been truly excellent, and all the content so far in the program has been truly excellent. I just want to um, uh, bring up one point that some of the um, organizers of this event have been demonizing Russia, not putting the focus on the NATO provocations of Russia. If uh, this could be um, explained, elaborated a little bit about how NATO has, using Ukraine as a proxy, has caused the war uh, in Ukraine, provoked Russia into action.
And if folks are happy cutting a little bit into the coffee break, and if any of our panelists want to kind of tackle this point, I think it's a really uh, important one, right, for, for the American left as we confront what does it mean to move into a multipolar world, and what does it mean for us to confront, um, yeah, just the, just the new future where the U.S. is becoming something far, far more different. Would you like answer to the question? You know, first of all, we never should forget the role of the Soviet Union to liberate Europe from the fascist dictatorship in the Second World War and the 27 million victims. <laughs> we should also never forget that the founding reason of NATO was the fight against Soviet Union, nothing else. And so the demonization of Soviet Union and now Russia was a historical and actual part of the presence of NATO. NATO makes no reason when they could not have the enemy, Russia or Soviet Union. That we should never forget. And definitely we have in Ukraine a proxy war. And definitely one of the main reasons of this war is the enlargement of NATO to the East. We should never forget that the great agreements, that the great discussions, that the great common solutions after the end of the Cold War and the unification of Germany the NATO enlargement to the East was against the security in Europe, always. And this was mainly prepared by the United States leaderships that we should never forget. But all this, including all the activities for a putsch and other things in Russia, in, U in Ukraine, does not allow to attack an independent country. The aggression of Ukraine, of Russia against Ukraine, is illegal and against international law. Is that is his, the truth. That is not an exclusion for what is done by NATO, and that is not an argument for any arms export and arms support. This is only an argument for immediately negotiations and ceasefire and find a peaceful solution of this conflict. That is the challenges we have to face. And the background of the challenge is a policy of NATO and the United States which provoke this conflict. place to finish it up. Thank you so much to our panelists. We have Rainer who, you know, gave us a really great description about the militarization of the EU. Um, the threat, we talked about the threat of sovereign, you know, the, the threat of sovereignty to the U.S., kind of displacement as undergirding militarism, and the linchpins that the U.S. sees in Asia, and of course, the contradictions that we're working through. And my only last statement is, as we gear up towards a new Cold War, if the US has kind of built its entire platform, NATO itself, its violence, its bloodshed has been built on an extreme kind of brutal fascism, a brutal anti-communism. What does that mean about a relationship to a new socialism, to a new communism, to a new left as we move into the decline of American empire? Thank you so much to our panelists. And thank you so much for coming out. We're, we're a bit over, but hopefully you enjoy your coffee. Wonderful job. 20-minute coffee break. <laughs>